Well, I want to welcome you today to the continuation of Tenacious. How many feel like fighting after that, that video? Just give it a little, little knuckles. Let's see it. Let's see it. Where are, the, where are the guns for you? Hey, we're continuing this series looking at how do we fight for what matters most. This is a big weekend here in the Bay Area, Super Bowl weekend. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have tickets to the Super Bowl? Just raise your hands up high. We'd love to see. Nobody in this service here has tickets. All the people are at the game. But hey, um, good news is, those of you who are joining us online, sorry you missed out. We have free tickets in the lobby today after the, after, after the service. So, um, but you know. Sorry, you missed out. Just kidding. We're glad you're with us. But today, as we are continuing our journey, looking at the subject of how do we fight for what matters most, we kicked off a brand new teaching series last week. And the main idea of the whole series is this, that whenever we start fighting for what matters most, we will stop fighting over what matters least. That in essence, when we understand, when we get a bigger vision, a bigger purpose for our lives, when we start fighting for what matters most, we'll stop fighting over what matters least. That so much of our energy, so much of our passion, so much of our, our time goes towards fighting small battles. We get in fights in our homes. We get in fights at our workplaces. We get in fights in the church sometimes. And this all happens often because we don't have a bigger picture. So we're looking at the life of Daniel from the Old Testament of the Bible. How Daniel lived in a time of tremendous wickedness. He, he lived at a place where it would have been very difficult to follow the ways of God, much like we have today in the 21st century. But Daniel chose to fight battles not against the world, but the internal battles of character. So last week we looked at the subject of integrity, and we saw from Daniel's life how he was exiled from Jerusalem all the way over to Babylon. And in this wicked nation, Daniel chose to live with integrity, to not defile himself on the ways of wicked Babylon. And today we're going to continue looking at the subject of humility. We're going to talk about how do we step from pride into greater levels of humility. We're going to fight for that hard attitude. And here's the big idea that we're going to look at today. God in his heart, in his desire, fights for people who live with humility, and he stands against people who live with pride. God fights for the humble and against the proud. So, you know, in like Super Bowl terms, it, would you rather have God be your fullback in front of you or the nose tackle against you? That's your choice today. We're going to choose to let the favor and power of God rest upon our lives as we step into greater levels of humility. Whenever I talk about humility, I'm reminded of some conversations I used to have with my parents. In fact, my, my dad was uh, in the last, my dad and my stepmom were in the last service with us here. And my dad, when, when I was a kid, used to have some phrases that he would say to me that would, that would push me over the line. Now, teenagers, you, you, you know how sometimes you get in a fight with your parents and you know that place, right? Maybe you did it. You know that place where you're going to put them over the line? Like you know what to say, what buttons to press, and then they're gone. They're, they're angry, and you're grounded, but they're really, really angry. So my dad, I, I used to know how to do this to him, and he knew how to do the same thing to me. And one of my phrases, one of the phrases my dad would often say to me is, Andy, you think that the world revolves around you. You think that the world just is in orbit around you. And it would make me so mad. You don't know why it would make me mad? Because it was true. Because there was a part of me and there's a part of you and there's a part of all of us that we really do think that we are at the center of the universe. And if everybody would just orbit around us, life would be a little bit easier. If our, our spouse would do what we want, if our kids would do what we want, if our boss would just get in line, everything would work out a little bit better. That hard attitude at its core is pride. When we start to think that the world would be better if it just moved around us. And Daniel understood some principles that were the opposite of this. And we're going to see from his story and Nebuchadnezzar today how we move from pride to humility. Daniel chapter 4, I want to encourage you to turn there and journey with me as we walk through this passage. The context of Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar says this. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Now, remember from last week, Nebuchadnezzar was the personification of evil. 
He dripped with arrogance and narcissism. He had inscribed on all of the bricks all throughout Babylon, I am Nebuchadnezzar the Great. So here Nebuchadnezzar is at home, hanging out in his palace. This is like an episode of Ode. Old Testament cribs, kind of like MTV cribs, right? Old Testament cribs, he's hanging out at his palace. And if it were modern days, Nebuchadnezzar's palace would have one place down the corridor where there was a Mexican restaurant. He could get some tortillas and get some dos equis and get a little coronas. And so down here, they have the best chefs at the Mexican restaurant. You go a little bit further down, there's all the pho that you could want, the Vietnamese restaurant, and then over here, there's a Mediterranean restaurant. So he had at his fingertips anything that he could wish for or want. And in addition to all of this lush food and arrangements, King Nebuchadnezzar also had a harem. He had all the women that he could want at his fingertips. He could walk into a room and see a bunch of beautiful young gals and be like, okay, I want that one at eight. I want that one at 10. I want that one at noon, I want that one at two, I want that one at four, I want that one at six, I want that one at eight, all day long, and he could do it again the next day. And there was such a sense of comfort and excess for King Nebuchadnezzar. I I want us to see from this story how comfort and excess are the breeding grounds for pride. That whenever you and I find ourselves at a place of tremendous comfort and tremendous excess, Excess. It is ideal circumstances for pride to develop in our hearts and in our lives. Now, I'm not sure if we have any knowledge of comfort and excess in Silicon Valley, but <laughs> I was having a conversation with a friend this week who works at one of the tech companies, and he, he's a part of uh, attracting talent to the business. It's a tech company. It's one of the biggest ones. I'm not going to say the name, but it's one of the biggest ones. And he was explaining to me how... This, this has shifted. You know, it, it used to be that professional football players and basketball players would, would lobby for contracts, but now engineers lobby for contracts. Did you know that? And they will decide which tech company they go to based upon the salary, number one, but then the perks that that tech company offers to people. So they have a ranking system, and it started off way back in the day when, when Google started giving out free food, and then it's just grown from there. So it began where you'd go to work, and you have free lunch, which is a good deal, right? But then it it increased to where it's like free breakfast, lunch, and dinner at your place of work, so that you never have to leave, and you could eat all day at your company. But then there was all these other companies that were like, well, if they're going to give out free breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we're going to have to start giving babysitting for free as well. So it went from breakfast, lunch, and dinner to, to free babysitting. But then the other company is like, well, we have to build a gym inside of our company for people to come and work for us. And we, we probably need a pool for people to go swimming in the middle of the day. If it gets too hot down in cubicle 2402, <laughs> we're going to have to go to the pool and, and cool off a little bit and swim. So, so somebody built a pool. Well, well that's awesome. But, but now we got the free babysitting. We got the pool. But man, it gets really really stressful around 3 p.m. So we need to have a spa that people can go to in the middle of the day. So I'm not joking. I mean, this is, this, is, this is reality. So it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So now what has happened is there's actually this syndrome called entitled Googler syndrome, where people, people start to feel like, man, I, I deserve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you are not going to give me free coconut water, I'm leaving and I'm walking down here to Yahoo because they got, these Yahoo's got free coconut water for me. So uh, that's where I'm going to work. Did you know, did you know that there are, are places where people make their employees pay for their own lunch? <laughs> that is so crazy. It's like, It's like they they actually, did you know that there are companies that actually make people hire babysitters for their kids? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just like, who do they think they are, right? Making us pay for our own lunch. It's just ridiculous. Nobody's laughing. 
if you work at Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Intel, or any of these other companies. I mean, it, it's amazing, though, this mentality, because what happens is then it creeps in that I'm entitled. In my generation, especially from like mid-30s down to mid-20s, we got this entitled syndrome where we think just because we breathe, breathe we should be getting free stuff, Right? And that entitlement, that comfort, and that excess leads us to think that we, because we exist, therefore we deserve. So comfort and excess are ideal breeding grounds for pride to start puffing up inside of us. Not realizing that there were some folks way back when that sacrificed and actually there's somebody that's paying for my lunch. So we're going to see from Nebuchadnezzar's story how he, he's got this big old kingdom it's growing, excess, pride's creeping in his heart. He goes to sleep one night and he has a dream. And the dream says that he sees visions that terrify him awake. H have you ever had a moment like that where you had a dream that terrified you awake? You know, you, you woke up and maybe somebody you love, they're gone. You lost your job, you... I don't know, you were naked in the aisle at Safeway. Something happened, right? Like you, you, you wake up and you, your, your palms are sweaty and your heart's beating fast and your mouth is dry. And there you are, you're, you're wide awake in the middle of the night and you, you're freaking out. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He's freaking out in the middle of the night. And he knows at this point that Daniel is able to interpret dreams. So he calls Daniel in and he says, Daniel, I need you, I need you to tell me what this dream means. So he describes it. He says, this is the dream. In my dream, there was a big, tall, massive tree. It grew all the way up to the edges of heaven, where heaven and earth collide. And then it spread out. So it was tall and it was wide. And its width spread to the edges of the earth. And all of a sudden, inside of this incredible, lavish, wonderful tree was all the fruit that you could imagine, Daniel. There were, there were oranges, there were, there were bananas, there were pears, there were figs, there were fig newtons. There, I mean, there was, there was everything that you could imagine. And then there were all these animals inside. There were birds, yellow birds, blue birds, red blue birds. They're going back and forth, tweeting all over the place. And on top of that, there were all these animals on the ground. There were dogs, there were cows, there were cats, there were no, no cats, but there were sheep. There were, there were, we're leaving cats out. But there, there were all these animals on the ground crawling around. And then there were people. And they were enjoying life. It was lavish. There was protection. And there was provision, Daniel. And then, in the middle of my dream, one comes from heaven and says, chop the tree down. Just leave it as a stump. It's crazy. Right there in the Bible. Just all of a sudden, big lavish tree. It's, it's there. It's gone. And so Nebuchadnezzar is talking to Daniel. Now, you know how sometimes in conversations, like you feel stressed, you feel a little bit overwhelmed, and then you tell somebody and you feel better, right? You feel better, they feel worse. So Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel and then all of a sudden, Daniel starts freaking out, and he feels worse. So maybe his face goes white, his eyes light up a little bit, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, Daniel, don't feel so bad about this dream. But just a minute ago, Nebuchadnezzar had woken up in the middle of the night, and he was, he was afraid of the dream, so the, the fear transfers from Daniel, from Nebuchadnezzar, over to Daniel. And Daniel is wrestling through, at this moment, what is he going to do with the dream that has just been described to him because he understands what Nebuchadnezzar has just said. That dream is about Nebuchadnezzar. That's about his power, his greatness, his lavishness coming to an end and being chopped down to a little stump. And Daniel knows at this point Nebuchadnezzar, who's the personification of evil, who's murdered people for less than telling them the consequence of a dream, Daniel knows that if he tells Nebuchadnezzar what the dream means, that he could become a little stump and his neck could be lopped off. So he feels now this anxiety and this pressure of what is he going 
to do. And he looks at Nebuchadnezzar and he's like, here's why I'm terrified. If that dream was just for your enemies, that'd be great. But Nebuchadnezzar, the dream is about you. You're the tree. You're the tree that grew really big and powerful, and you're the tree that got chopped down. And he says, this is the interpretation in Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse number 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree that the most high has issued against my Lord the king. Notice even in Daniel, in the midst of this story, the humility that he shows. That he, he could have rebuked Nebuchadnezzar for his pride and for his arrogance, but he humbly speaks to him. And he says this, you will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals and you will eat grass like cattle. Now, I know some of y'all like to do shots of wheat grass. It's nasty stuff, man. It's gross stuff. But this is, this is like seven years. He says, in fact, seven times will pass in front of you until you acknowledge. All of this is a warning for the heart condition of pride that is creeping into Nebuchadnezzar as, as a leader of the most powerful nation on the face of the planet. He's giving him a, a warning to say, this is you. This is what's going to happen until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and he gives them to anyone that he wishes. Until you acknowledge, Nebuchadnezzar, that heaven rules and you don't stand over the kingdoms of men, until you see that there's one who's put it all into orbit, until you recognize and humble yourself before the God of the universe, until you see that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone that he wishes, this will be your plight. Now, did you guys know that in 2016 there's going to be an election? You guys know that? Just out of curiosity, every four years it happens. Do you know that? Yeah, every four years they elect a new president. And so this year I'm, I'm watching all this play out. And, you know, I, I, I've been really careful as a pastor to never leverage the church for politics and I think that that's a good thing. Sometimes pastors are like more into politics than actually talking about Jesus. So I'm not making a political statement here, okay? So before I say a political statement, I'm just saying I'm not making a political statement. So what's amazing to me, though, is how people freak out around election time. It's unbelievable. Now, at our church, we have left wing, we have right wing, we have back wing, front wing. I mean, we have everything you can imagine here when it comes to politics, and I love that. I love the diversity of our church. But, but what's amazing to me is so you'll get somebody who's like super far right wing conservative. And God bless you if that's you. But, but they'll get so worried. Like if, if, if Hillary Clinton becomes the president of the United States of America, I'm moving to Canada. Right? And then over here on, on the, the other side, you're like, well, if that hairdo and Donald Trump kids in the office. I'm going over here to Mexico. See y'all later, right? And you know what's amazing to me? I'm 34. There have been five presidents since I've been alive. And did you know every four years they elect a new one? And the longest you can be president is eight years. So that means in 2024, if Hillary or Bernie Sanders or Rubio or Palin runs again. I don't know. If, if they're elected in four years, there's a new election. And in eight years, there's a new president no matter what. So that means that one rotates on and another rotates off. And one rotates on and another rotates off. And one rotates on and another's off. And did you know in, a, in about 30 years, your kids and grandkids won't even remember the name of the president. They'll be memorizing it for some list. And they'll be like, what what, what that guy do back, back in 2000?" 2016, I have no idea, but he was the president in 2016. See, the reality of it is that we get so worked up because often 
we forget or maybe we don't realize that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and he gives them to anyone that he wishes. So Daniel can thrive even in Babylon with the most wicked king maybe in all of human history. So regardless of what happens politically, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine if you trust the sovereign king of the universe who gives kingdoms to those he wishes. And there's, there, there's an essence of, of, of what Daniel is trying to teach and God's trying to teach to Nebuchadnezzar is that your influence, Nebuchadnezzar, is a stewardship. Your leadership is a gift that is given to you. And no matter how much influence you and I have, whether it's a family or a workplace or an entire corporation or an entire nation, that your influence is a gift, it's stewardship, and you and I and Nebuchadnezzar will all be accountable for everything that is placed into our hands. So Nebi, hey, here's your opportunity to turn back to God in humility. Until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. So the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored, that when you acknowledge heaven rules. Therefore, even notice again, Daniel, therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed so that it may be your prosperity will continue. And right here in the midst of the story, Daniel and God are trying to give an opportunity for King Nebuchadnezzar to recognize that God is in control and he can turn back to God in humility or he can continue on in his pride. And either if he humbles himself, he'll find God fighting for him. Or if he continues in his pride, he will find God fighting against him. Now, if you're Nebuchadnezzar in this moment, and Daniel comes in with this warning, I think most of us at this point are like, okay, I got the message. You woke me up in the middle of the night with a dream. I see the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar gets it for a period of time. And, and I want us to notice even in the midst of this story. See, sometimes I think in our minds, we separate the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. We're like, well, well, in the New Testament, it's all grace and it's love and it's kindness. But then when you go to the Old Testament, it's like judgment and condemnation. But see, even in this story, tucked within is this tremendous mercy from God to Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the face of the planet, with all this authority and all of this influence, that if he continues in his pride, think of the destruction, think of the lives that will fall apart as a result of his arrogance, the people who are being oppressed by him. So God, in his mercy, gives Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to turn back in repentance and acknowledge his dependence upon the Most High God. It's really not that complicated, Daniel's saying. All he wants is you just to acknowledge that you're not God. That's all he's asking. And to acknowledge that it's all been given to you and that it's all a gift. This is not something that you built. This is not for your greatness, Nebuchadnezzar. It's, it's, it's all something that God deposited into your hands. And in a moment, God could take it all away from you. In one moment, it could all be gone. That mentality creeps into our hearts and it creeps into our minds very easily and oftentimes it's very subtle. I watched my dad as a business owner. He owned a plumbing company and for 35 years he's led this company and faithfully, diligent, and it's like a wave. It's been, it's been going for a long period of time. And every so often somebody will come in and they'll do well and they'll ride the wave a little bit. They'll see the success, they'll see the growth, and then they'll start to think to themselves, well, well, they need me. And if I'm out of here, this whole thing's going to fall apart. What are they going to do without me? You ever had that thought before? Man, my, my team at work, they just, they need me. If, if I'm gone, they're, this, they're not going to get the project done in time. If I leave, the company's not going to grow. If I take off, everything's going to fall 
apart. And I've watched for three and a half decades. Well, I didn't watch when I was a baby, but you know, I've watched as a teenager and into my adult years, I've watched that person leave and go start their own thing in pride. And about two to three years down the road, it's one dude in a truck making less money than he was making when he was making for my dad. And the wave's gone. No more wave to ride. And often, I think that we're like that in our lives. We ride the wave of God's favor, and we ride the wave of his blessing, and we look around and we're like, "Woo! look at the waves I made. What's up? That's my wave right there. And God, in his mercy, will step in from time to time to get our attention, to open our eyes, to see that it's all a gift that has been given from him. So Nebuchadnezzar, about 12 months later, the story says, is up on his rooftop. 12 months later, the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Look at this picture right here. This is probably what King Nebuchadnezzar is looking at as he's walking around on the palace of Babylon. This beautiful city, the most powerful city in the most powerful nation on the face of the entire planet. And he's standing up there, Babylon, looking at Babylon, and this is what he says. Is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my, notice the personal pronouns, me, myself, and I, that I have built as the royal residence for, by my mighty power, for the glory of my majesty. Look at it. Look at the business I built. Look at the family that I put together. Look at the, pro, look at the, look at the iPhone 6S that I made. Look at the church or the life group or the ministry that I built. The, the arrogance that creeps inside of us as we're riding the wave of God's grace individually and to all of humanity. We look and we're like, well, if I'm gone, the wave's coming down. It's all about me. And here's what pride says. This is the boast of pride. Pride boasts this statement. I'm great. I built it. And it's all about me. I'm great, I built it, and it's all about me. And here's Nebuchadnezzar. He steps onto the roof, he looks out, and he steps one giant leap into pride. And the story says that as the words were still on his lips... It's like he ain't even got it out. It's like a movie. I, I love it. Babylon, I'm awesome. Blah, 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 Voice from heaven. And it says this. Is, all right, I'll grab my Bible. I thought I was with you, but that's in here. While the words were still on his lips, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. And you will be driven away from people, and you'll live with wild animals, and you will eat grass like cattle. And seven times will pass by, seven years will pass by until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and he gives them to anyone that he wishes. Now, I want us to realize the weight of this, okay? Think about in this moment, the most powerful person on the face of the planet, all the authority, all the strength, all the honor that is bestowed upon him. And out into the wilderness he goes, and he's going to crawl around on a dog and bark for seven years. And his hair is going to grow so that it looks like an eagle's feathers, like dreadlocks just coming down. And his fingernails are going to grow out so that they look like bird crawls. Claus. Somebody just said he'd fit in in Santa Cruz. Throw some, throw, throw some pastel on him and, and nobody will know. It's Nebuchadnezzar right there in Santa Cruz. But here is this guy that is in the depths 
of his pride and arrogance, stripped of everything that is good in his life to the fact that you couldn't even recognize him anymore. And this is what the scripture is teaching is the consequence of pride in our hearts. We, we often say that when, when pride walks onto the stage, God walks off the stage. When pride becomes the heart attitude of our lives, not only do we find the hand of God removed from our lives, but we find ourselves standing face to face with the powerful most high God against us on the other side of the line. I don't know about you, but man, I don't want to stand against God. I, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather be on his team. I, I don't know, Broncos or Panthers. I, I just, I'd like to get on his team. Because last time I checked, he's undefeated. And, and his record goes in the past, and it's, it's going to keep going into the future. And until we can acknowledge in our heart with humility that we're not God, and we didn't build this, and it's not by our power, and everything that's been placed into our hands is a gift from God to be stewarded, and every single one of us are going to stand before God accountable. See, oftentimes we get the subject of humility confused. And we think that humility is like thinking less of ourselves. You know the false humble guy, right? He's like, oh, I, I, I suck. I'm really bad. I'm really, I'm really, I don't know. We, we get that false humility. That, that's not humility. Humility leads to confidence. Daniel is confident in the voice of God because he, he's listened, but he understands that everything that is in his hands has been given to him. So his confidence is not in his power. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself quite so much. It's thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis said that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So, okay, we're going to do an interview, everybody, and we're going to do like pride and, and, and humility, okay? So you're going to lift your hand, say if you're prideful or humble, okay? You ready? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You can see it on your face. You're nervous there. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to throw out some questions for us to wrestle through in our own hearts to know whether or not we are living with pride or humility. And these questions will reveal in us whether or not we're creeping towards pride or we're moving towards humility. First question, what do you do, how do you treat people who can do nothing for you? You know what's interesting is about Jesus, how the disciples wouldn't allow children to get to him. And I think that this is a part of the glimpse of the heart of God's humility that was exuded in Jesus with all of these children that could do nothing for Jesus. If you notice his ministry, how he stooped to people who were in poverty, who were struggling, people who could do nothing for him. Have you ever noticed that? How easily we shift how much more kind we are to somebody if we think they can give us Super Bowl tickets? How much, how much more love and respect we show to somebody if we think they can do something for us? But the gospel, the message of Jesus is that we could not do anything for ourselves, but he stooped to our level to make those of us who are broken and hurting great because of his grace and his mercy. So how do we do treating people who can do nothing for us. Second question is how do I do with feedback? You know, I, I, we have on our front row um, two worship leaders here at South Bay Church. Sam, who leads here at North San Jose, if you love him, yeah. give him a shout out. And Jonathan, who led here last night. Jonathan came to me after the Saturday night service and said, can you give me some feedback so that I can get better? Sam does this all the time. Help me grow as a leader. That is humility. 
when God finds a young person or he finds an old person who says, hey, I need to grow. I need to get better. I'm willing to let people speak into my life. God gives his favor to that person. That teachability is evidence of humility. How do you do with feedback? How do you do when somebody corrects you? Your spouse corrects you. You know the, you know the face? Like, no, I got it. I got it. No, 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 no. Guys do it all the time, right? Just watch. Just watch. I, sometimes as a leader, I do this, okay? This is a little secret. 1130 service, I'm a little bit looser. But sometimes I will, when somebody comes into our inner circle or onto our staff, I'll correct them real quickly. Now, I'm not making stuff up. I'm not like eyebrows higher than the other one, you know? And the, I'm, 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 I'm seeing things that need to grow and shift and change and in love, I'm sharing that because I want, I want that to come to the surface quickly. And if there's somebody in your life, unless you're covenantally obligated to them to stay in a marriage or a relationship, when you find somebody who is like that, that is so haughty, get away from them as quick as you can and remove yourself in that kind of relationship. So how do I respond when people give me feedback? Number three is this. How do I do with deflecting credit and accepting blame? How do I do when, when, when the team wins? I love the, I love the Warriors. Any Warriors fans? Okay, so here's what happens with the Warriors, right? You're watching them play ball, and you're like, somebody just shoot the ball, right? It's like, no, you take it. 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 Finally, okay, I shoot three, and Duffy, or uh, Stephon Curry hits the three right behind. Duffy, that's an old dude, but he hits the three and it's, he deflects it. That's what humility does. When there are wins, we deflect back to other people. We give the credit and then we accept responsibility for the places that we, we need to own it. There's a mirror and there's a window in front of all of us. And the question is, do we, do we look into the mirror for the areas that need to grow or do we, we, we look out the mirror to try to shift the blame to somebody else and then uh, look, look, or look out the window to shift the blame to somebody else and look in the mirror for our own credit so that we can, we can be great? You ever notice that? Like sometimes you're with people and they're like, you know, back, back when I was over here and I did this and that and that and this and I was an elder over at this church and, I, da, 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 and you're like, eventually you're just like, okay, you don't have to tell me. It'll show up. Like if, you, if you're really getting stuff done, it's going to show up. You don't have to prove yourself. So how do I do with deflecting credit and accepting blame? Number three. And then the last one is this. How do I do? This is probably the hardest one, especially for dudes. How do I do with acknowledging my need for help? Men, especially, it's like, I got this right? I see it in my boys. I see it in me. Do it. My kids had this phrase, do it, what? Self. Do it, self. And it continues into adulthood. But humility brings us to that place where we can acknowledge our need for help, for God's grace and intervention and the blessing and help of other people in our lives. And at the core, at the essence of the message of Jesus, in desperation we see that without God's help, we are nothing. And Nebuchadnezzar, he has to go into the wilderness. He has to run in circles in pride and arrogance and the consequences of it to get to that place. But it did not have to be that way. It did not have to be such that he would bark around like a dog for years. And finally, at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's story, in Daniel chapter 4, it says, Immediately what it said had been fulfilled, and then at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored, and then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. And today, no matter where you are in your journey spiritually, there is hope for you. There's a way to be restored, and the path to your restoration is humility and recognition of your need for God and his grace in your life. And it's really, it's just that simple. We overcomplicate it so often. And God is making this incredible invitation to us today to say, will you humble yourself before me and acknowledge your need 
for my help in your life. If you've been coming to South Bay for some period of time, you know that Stacy and I have a son who we adopted from Ethiopia. I want to show you a picture of him so you can see how beautiful he is. Seven years old, good-looking kid. Our best hopes of having a college athlete in the family are right there in that (laughs) child. And I will never forget when five years ago we went to Ethiopia and we met his birth mother and we asked her, why'd you put him up for adoption? And she said, you know, there, there were many days through a translator, she said there were many days where it's noon, it's one o'clock, and neither of us had eaten. And I knew what would happen to his life if I kept him. I knew that one day he, he'd probably be begging on the streets. I knew that one day he, he, he might actually die because he didn't have a new, enough nutrition. So his birth mother marched him down to a local orphanage and dropped him off because she knew that that was his only hope. And sometimes when I'm, I'm watching him and he's on a roller coaster with his hands up or he's eating bacon kid loves bacon. He loves barbecue. And sometimes I'm watching him and I'll play the movie in my mind. And I'll think what his life would would have been like at seven years old. He might have been walking through the streets, desperate, looking through trash cans for somebody's leftovers. He might have been begging on the streets in Ethiopia. He might, have, he might have gotten to a place where he had to be sold into slavery because there was not enough for him. And I'll play the movie, and it makes me so grateful for his birth mother. She's the hero of Sammy's story. And it will make me so grateful, and it will humble me to realize that I've got to be a part of this little boy's transformation to see what his life is like and what it could have been. Why am I telling you this? I've been a follower of Jesus now for a long time, like almost 80% of my life. And every so often I forget what my life would be like apart from God's grace. And I'll just play the movie. This is the kind of man that I would be filled with anger and pride and selfishness, and my marriage probably would have ended by now, and I wouldn't have a relationship with my children even if I did have children. And I think about what my life would be if God had not intervened on my behalf. And you know what it does? It humbles me. And it brings me back to that place to realize that there is a God who's sovereign over the universe, but he's also near and loving and gracious, and he's for you. All he wants is your humility. And today he's making an invitation to you. You know, what's amazing about the ministry of Jesus is that people tried to push him forward into this place of, of earthly honor and prominence. And his disciples were clamoring for authority and control and power. And one time, they sent their mom, two disciples, go read it, Matthew chapter 20, sent their mom, put your mom up to your dirty work, sent their mom to Jesus and said, hey, when you get into heaven, uh, can you give James and John the right and left hand in your kingdom over all of heaven for all of eternity? (laughs) Such a ridiculous request. Like, yeah, sure. I'll give it to him. When we get there, you'll see. But Jesus, in his grace, looks and says, you've got this whole thing off. This is not how it is in my kingdom. For the son of man, the king of all kings and lord of all lords, 
did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he said, I will die the death that they should have died on a rugged Roman cross and laid down my life. And he reoriented the whole value system of humanity all the way up until that point, it was pride is awesome, pride is virtuous, but Jesus changed it to say, this is virtue right here. It's when somebody fully grasps the reality that they are loved by God with his infinite mercy and kindness, but it's not all about you and it's not all about me. It's so that love can get to us and get to others. And God in his grace is looking for people who have that heart that are willing to say, God, I need you. I'm desperate for you. I can't do life without you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for an empty tomb. Thank you for your spirit that you empower me with. Thank you for spiritual gifts. Thank you for the relationships in my life. You've been so good to me. If it weren't for you, I'd be in anger. I'd be in destruction. I'd be broken. My life would have fallen apart. I'd be crawling on the ground like a... Like a, like a horse or a cow or a dog, but because of your mercy, you are good. It's for your glory. It's for your greatness. So God, I need you. Amen. Would you tell him today that you need him from your heart? Let's bow our heads and pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you that you fight for us. God, I pray that in our church, I pray that with my leadership and with our staff and the leaders of this church, that you would find humility in us. We beg of you, Jesus. We are desperate for your favor in our lives. We are desperate for your grace and your mercy. Thank you. For the empty tomb that declares your power and your glory that death could not hold you down. And thank you today that we can come regardless of our brokenness, regardless of our past, regardless of how much of a stump we've been declared by the world, that we can come before you and reignite passion and life and strength so that our branches can flourish again in you. We want to be rooted in humility in you. It's all for you. We depend upon you, Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray these things. In Jesus' name we pray.